it's no secret that the current state of the building and construction sector is dire. It's unethical, it's improper, it's immoral. This is a story about a broken industry, about boulevards of broken dreams full of unfinished homes, about tradies and suppliers unpaid in their thousands. I'm sad, it makes me sad for the people. They may not be able to keep working. There doesn't seem to be an appetite for government to actually deal with the problem. In this Four Corners, we follow supply chain pressures that are driving some building companies to the brink, and we expose others that rack up debt, liquidate and reincarnate. It's a March night in the suburbs of southeast Melbourne. Rahul Madan has decided to lock in the builder for his family's dream home. I got an email on 6th of March from Porto Davis that end of this month is your last time to sign the contract to lock the price. And then on 29th of March, we paid $10,000 because our limit was $10,000 a day. And then the balance of $4,884 I paid on 30th of March, which is Thursday evening at 6.45 p.m. Hours later, a social media post catches Rahul's wife Pooja's attention. I'm a part of the Facebook group, Porter Davis customers, and there were posts there that they might go into liquidation and there are delays happening, something is going wrong with Porter Davis, but we didn't trust that Facebook post. I was numbed at that time. I asked her to share me that screenshot. Send me that screenshot of that Facebook page where they're saying liquidation. I straight away emailed to Porter Davis to whom I was dealing with. I mentioned in the email that, is it true? I saw this on the Facebook page of Porter Davis customer portal that you guys are going into the liquidation. I am very, very, very stressed at that time. He emails again. I mentioned in the email, I mentioned word scared, that I'm very much scared. Is it true? By the morning, liquidators had taken control of the Porter Davis Group. About two and a half thousand customers were affected by the collapse. What they have done to us was not the right thing to do. They should have stopped like a month ago, like they should have stopped taking the deposit. Now they have taken our deposit a night before when they're going into liquidation. We've not expected of such a big builder living in Australia that this could happen to us. You trusted the whole process. Trust is all gone. Trust, really trust, is all gone. Now you can't trust any builder in, the, in, in this industry. According to the liquidators, Porter Davis may have been insolvent from February. It burnt through customers' deposits as the company desperately tried to generate cash flow for the failing business. It has impacted me emotionally and physically. I'm more depressed, more anxious. I'm getting the panic attacks and all that. Mentally, I'm like suffering and it's not easy for our family. We are struggling, I would say. Financially, we are struggling and um, it's, it's a lot. We are seeing such levels of financial distress that there's nothing to save. And so what happened in Porter Davis was that went straight into liquidation. If you are paying a deposit, anyone that pays money over in the dying hours or days of a business is extremely unfortunate. There's a question of, is it legal or is it ethical? They're two different questions sometimes. Um, definitely not ethical. The couple are paying a mortgage they took out to buy the land on top of the mortgage on their current home 
They now face a long construction delay and potential replacement builders want big money, raising doubts about whether they can afford their dream home. Honestly, I don't want to sell. This is my dream. Whatever it will take me to keep the dream alive, I will do, but it's all with the God and, you know, I don't know whether I can fulfill that or not. Rahul's working two jobs to make the dream happen and recoup the money his family lost to Porter Davis. I work current job and I'm doing the part-time as Uber driver as well. Friday and Saturday night, I never be at home in the evening with my family. I'm just driving Uber because those are the two days where you can earn a little bit more. There's stories like this across the country. Australia has experienced the highest rate of construction insolvencies in a decade. Over the past year, nearly 30% of all company failures are in the building industry. We've come out of COVID, an artificial environment that disrupted supply chains. Input costs for everything, steel, timber, plasterboard, everything has doubled, tripled and more. When you've got so many factors spinning out of control that aren't within normal forecasts and normal ranges, it, it is very difficult. Porter Davis went broke owing creditors more than $147 million. Earthlift Excavations managing director Peter McLeod worked with the home builder for decades. Porter Davis made up 15% of his company's business. How much money did you lose? The debt that they owed us was just under $1.4 million. In my time, in 20 odd years, it would be the most difficult time that I've, I've seen for, uh, for the builders as well as the, as well as the subbies and contractors. Morning, Pete. How, How are we? All right. Good. So what's happened with your costs? We've had some horrendous increases in cost in the last few years, actually, and not only due to COVID. COVID increased wages and supply costs and all those sorts of things, but the weather was a, a major influence in the last couple of years, so our transport costs went up considerably. Our tipping costs in some cases went up two, three, four hundred percent in some places. So we absorbed those costs for as long as we could, but we got to a point where we had to start passing them on to the clients, on to the builders. So they're massive cost increases. Overall, <laughs> how would it average out? Oh, it, it could have been it could have been anywhere to around a 30% increase. And do you have to pass that on to a builder like Porter Davis? Yep. Yep. We had to increase our rates with them and they didn't like it when we went to renegotiate rates. They didn't like it, but we said, well, we need to do it or we're not going to be here in 12 months' time to do your work. Peter's business has insurance that will cover part of the money lost. Many smaller subcontractors lack that safety net. You're a big operator. If it's been that tough for you, what must it be like for the little guys? It would have been very difficult. People that do what we do, they've got payments on trucks to make and payments on machines and all those sorts of things and families to feed, it, it would have been a very tough time. And it still is a tough time. There's, there's a lot of people really, really doing it hard at the moment. Before the Porter Davis collapse, this warehouse was a hive of activity. It's home to a small company that seized a business opportunity. Sandy, fire it up and show me how it works. So the coil steel will be put into the, this machine. 
and later on we'll turn on here and start here. There it goes. Houses are usually made with timber frames, but as the prices shot up, Sandy Chen started making house frames out of steel. Later on, after all making in here, we will use the truck delivery to the construction site. Porter Davis was his largest customer. Sandy spent big money on materials for a pipeline of work for the building company. This pile has cost me $5,000, and all in this warehouse roughly cost me about $400,000. And this all for Porter David. So we actually need to buy the material to prepare for it. This roughly can build up to like a 60 to 80 house. Now, suddenly Porter David sat down. We don't know what should we to do it. Where can I sell it? Who can I sell it? Porter Davis owes him nearly 900000 If they can pay me the money, we can easily pay the 120000 to my supplier. So they much miss call in my mobile phone. Just like hundreds and hundreds of calling for my supplier, my subcontractor, my worker, my firm, my family. They are just calling me to ask, are you all right? That's tough. That's why for now it's very difficult time for my business, also for myself, because I got a lot of stress in my head. And because of like uh, before in this warehouse, we roughly along 10 to 11 people working in here. Now you can see it, only two or three people working in here. You've lost most of your workers. Yes, and I also uh, lost about 70% of my business too. Anyway, happen is happen. Yeah, so mm. this is life. Well before Porter Davis collapsed, there was another massive home building company that found itself in serious strife. But unlike Porter Davis, it survived. Brad, good to meet you. Come on in. Brad Duggan is the former CFO and the new chief executive of Australia's biggest residential building company, Metricon. A lot of the headwinds we've dealt with over the last you know, 24 months, I think a lot of them are behind us, particularly at Metricon. Uh, the difficulties we see a lot of builders encountering at the moment, it's quite interesting because we, we sort of faced into them probably 12, nine months ago and dealt with them. In 2020, as federal government stimulus sparked huge demand, Metricon took on an unprecedented volume of work. You had a 30% increase in work. Did you overextend and overcommit? Yeah, I think the Australian economy relies upon the construction industry and it often gets turned to for, to stimulate the economy and, and Home Builder definitely did do that. And we found ourselves you know, taking on a, a large increase in, our, in demand at a time when there was a significant reduction in our ability to supply that, um, that product. So I don't think we took on too much, if not for the fact that the, this, the resources that we needed to deliver those homes at the same time evaporated. <coughs> Australia's largest home builder, Metricon, has denied reports it is in financial difficulty. By mid last year, Metricon was in crisis. The company's founder and CEO had taken his own life. Fueling speculation, Metricon was going broke. It took a massive injection of funds from the family who owned the business and support from the Victorian state government to save Metricon. Let's cut to the chase. How close was Metricon to going under? I think Metricon had a lot of options. It needed some time to resolve you know, what those options were that the, the owners were going to uh, press the button on. How much money did the family put in? Yeah, I think in total the family's put in $80 million over the last uh, 12 months.
that Australia's biggest home builder was so close to toppling speaks volumes about underlying problems in the industry. Profit margins are so slim, any major disruption can be fatal. What sort of margins does Metricon operate on? Depends on which way you're looking at it, but our business generally makes a 2% net margin. That seems very thin. Yeah, it is, and that's yeah, as a volume builder, that's the thing, we, volume is important, and I think volume is important to the industry to make sure we keep costs as low as possible. But that, you know, that's, the, that's probably one of the things we're looking at as the industry, both residential and commercial, uh, as to the return for the risk that's taken on. John Murray is a 45-year veteran of the building industry, the former head of a major lobby group which represents builders. In an industry that operates on a margin of 2%, particularly in current circumstances where we have inflation of 7%, where we've got significant shortages of labour, where we've had building materials like steel and timber rising 20-30%, to have a margin of 2% is, is, is a recipe for, a, for an industry that, that lives on the edge of viability. Builders that operate on that sort of margin get tipped over into insolvency very quickly. He doesn't pull any punches about the state of the industry. It's a model that is unethical and it's a model that is broken, broken, because the people who operate, the majority of the people who operate in the industry are undercapitalised. And there's a knock-on effect here. When a builder becomes insolvent, the knock-on effect that that has on subcontractors is significant, because the subcontractors don't get paid, and because they're small businesses, they in turn become insolvent. Thank you. Thank you very All the best. Thank you. The harsh reality is that Sandy Chen and other subbies like him will get not a cent of the money they are owed by Porter Davis. Here's Sandy. Yeah. But Sandy still has to find a way to pay more than $100,000 to his supplier for materials he ordered before Porter Davis went under. How hard is the supplier chasing you? Oh, it's very hard in the moment. Uh, they keep calling me every second day and just keep asking, when can they get the money from me? Yeah, I understand, yeah. Yeah, I know it. Oh, give us some more time, we will get it done. Big hard in the moment, the cash flow in. Just, just trust us, we will pay you back and just give us more time. How do you feel after taking that call? I don't know how should I tell him because I don't have that much money to pay him. <sighs> and the question they ask, just the same question. When you are going to pay me, I don't want to close down. And I tell him if I need, I will sell him my own house to pay back their money. We try to get a business loan from Commonwealth Bank, and they still didn't get back to us. Getting the loan could be make or break. How did it go? They still didn't have any result yet. Uh, they tell me the bank statement look good, but just they bit worried about most of money come from Porter David, and now Porter David is going to shut down. So if they give me a business loan, how can we uh, service the loan? Alongside building companies undone by tough times, there are those that flout the law. The Dildum Group was once a towering force. 
Its rise and fall shows the limits of the system for dealing with insolvent companies and a failure of corporate regulation. The records were incomplete. The real intention was to be in control, but not to be visibly in control. They've been trading with Telvin pretty much right from the start. The Dildum Group has left a trail of misery. Bankrupt businesses, unpaid taxes, tradies denied payments, and anguished buyers in defective buildings. But it wasn't always that way. My name is Joe Katar. I'm the CEO of Dildam and one of the founder of Dildam back in 1969. Its empire was founded by Joe Katar, who worked with his wife Chahida and was later joined by brother-in-law Sam Fayed and Sam's son Fayed Lee Fayed. One of the problems with these groups is the sheer number of companies that they employ in their construct of their empires. I did a company search of all the companies related to the group, and I came up to about 180 of them. I'm subsequently told there's been more incorporated since then. A decade ago, cracks began to appear. Administrators took control of Plaza West, a company linked to Dildum that built the Entrada Apartments at Parramatta. It collapsed, owing 28 million to creditors. First company I was appointed to was Plaza West, which was in a financial position, massive tax debts, and a fairly interesting balance sheet. Some of the so-called assets weren't really assets at all. Uh, some uh, items on the balance sheet weren't correct. And that the position that the director had played with regards to disclosing its position was fundamentally wrong. Sam Fayette's wife Maria was listed as sole director. Months before the builder went under, Joe Qatar, Chahida Qatar, and Sam Fayed all resigned as company officers. Maria Fayed, putting her in a position of being a director, she had no uh, idea of the detail of any of the transactions or any of the machinery of which this company had operated. You're moving assets and you're moving liabilities across a broad range of companies with a multiple of different directors, even though the mastermind of any of these groups is usually the one or two people. Stephen Hathaway stayed on the case for four years following the money trail. The accounts falsely stated that another Dildum company was owed six and a half million. You think that this was a deliberate tactic to try to claw back money for the Dildam interests and push other creditors down the queue? Of course, that's the only reason you do it. Wouldn't be any other reason. The words from the Australian Tax Office was, yes, this, this was misleading and potentially a fraud. Working with the ATO, we were prepared to go to the court and get myself appointed liquidator with powers to actually unravel the transaction and then prosecute. Faced with that threat, the FIAD stumped up three and a half million to placate creditors. And the threat of being pursued through the courts went away. It is upsetting. Liquidators can only do so much. There needs to be another approach. In 2016, another collapse, Bauer Projects, the company behind this dildum development of Borkham Hills in Sydney's northwest. The company was insolvent from as early on as six months prior to the voluntary administrators being appointed. Without having turned a profit from its commencement or formation, it could have been insolvent right from the beginning. The Fayed and Qatar families owned 80% of Bauer projects. But on paper, Bauer's director was a man named Adrian Banks. Mr Banks, the sole director, indicated that the Dildum majority shareholders, and in particular the CEO of Dildum, shadowed every move that he made. He was not able to raise invoices on clients without the approval of 
the CEO of Dildum. He was not able to make payments without um, the CEO of Dildum actually approving those payments to employ a receptionist, which is, you know, a key employee, but not very high level, um, he had to obtain the approval of Mr. Fayed Fayed. Fayed Fayed was first Chief Operating Officer and then Chief Executive of Dildum Developments and Sam Fayed's son. Though Fayed Fayed wasn't a named director of Bauer Projects, the liquidator believes he was in control. At the time of its collapse, Bauer owed creditors nearly $25 million, including a million to the ATO. It became very clearly evident early on that the company was in distress, severe distress. It was unable to pay its creditors. It was unable to pay its subcontractors. These are hard-working Australian families that are out there trying to make a living honest living, and uh, I felt that there should be some responsibility taken by organisations like this, where they are in control, to consider, you know, the creditors, the subcontractors, the employees, and the public at large. the central coast of New South Wales. It's now home to one of the subbies who got caught up in the Bauer Projects fiasco. We got involved there through one of the project managers that had previously been with another company and he had gone there. And uh, he said to come and work for Bauer because they were backed by Dildem. So he said, they've got plenty of money, you'll be right. Ariana Tippis has booked her spot on the national team for the World Championships in Japan. In the first night of the national trials in Melbourne, the Olympic gold medalist was able to assert herself. Nigel Dunn did the earth moving for the apartment build, but lost $70,000 when Bauer went under. $70,000 might not sound much, but it is. It's hard to earn $70,000 profit. You've got to do another $700,000 worth of work just to get back to square on it. Nigel started digging. So I knew of other dildam jobs that had been run in the city and that around, around Sydney. So I went to other subbies and approached them to see what their experience had been and it was starting to repeat itself and then I would ask them who was the company that you're actually working for if you weren't working for Dildam and they'd tell me. So then you just had to go onto ASIC and do a company search and then you can see that they'd gone into liquidation and had liquidators appointed. Numerous other companies associated with Dildam that had done the same thing in the past. So Nigel picked up the phone to an influential radio host. I rang Ray Hadley simply because he goes into battle for, you know, contractors and truck drivers and everything else, and he's always um, trying to help them out and that. But Dildam were one of the major sponsors for 2GB. So it irked me that every day, because I listened to Ray, and every day I'd hear them, him telling everybody how good Dildam were and what great guys they were. And so I contacted Ray and I said to him, look, you're probably not aware of what's going on. And I, and I told him. But Nigel was one of many people that phoned me. There were quite a number of people who contacted me from, you know, painters, electricians, chip rockers, brickies, you know, a whole range of people just were not getting their money. And first of all, they weren't getting it for 90 days, then they weren't getting it for 120, then they weren't getting it for six months. And so it went on. Um, it, it was bad, very bad. Ray Hadley was close to the Qatar family, and for years he earned big money for his radio station by promoting Dildum on air. And good morning and welcome. Thursday the 8th of June, I'm Ray Hadley. Ray he told the bosses he couldn't keep doing it. There was, I guess, resistance from the sales department because it was a lot of money, a lot of money, and, and they said, oh, well, you know, couldn't you write it out? And I said, no, I can't write it out. It's my reputation. Uh, and if I keep telling people to go and buy units from them and they're not paying the subbies and, and then those who buy off the plant will be let down, well, you know, I, I can't in all conscience keep doing it. So they supported me and said, OK. Ballpark terms, what kind of money are we talking about? 
but certainly close to a million dollars. In semi-retirement, these days Nigel Dunn prefers to focus on his golfing handicap than his dealings with Dildum. It's just despicable. It makes you angry because you go out there and you're doing your best to try and make a living and pay your workers and do everything else. And it does make you angry. Look, like anything, you get over it and you have to move on. You just have to. You can't harbour that grudge forever. But Trevor Pogroski wouldn't let it go. With funding from the tax office, he used his power as a liquidator to haul people into court. If his investigations found there was a shadow director or directors, they could potentially be held personally liable for debts accrued while Bauer was trading insolvent. The examinations require each party to attend the court. They're not allowed to talk to any other of the witnesses. And we examine them in relation to questions that we consider appropriate. The advice that we receive from our barristers in relation to the public examinations was very strong to pursue fired, fired. But after the hearings, despite those positive prospects, the tax office pulled the plug. He wasn't pursued for insolvent trading. He wasn't pursued for breaches of his statutory duties. In the end, unsecured creditors receive no cents in the dollar and um, the matter was closed. In a statement via his lawyer, Fayed Fayed denied being shadow director of Bauer Projects and said any suggestion he was is categorically false. Astonishingly, despite creditors circling, the Dildum Group kept going. Maria Fayed resigned as director the day the parent company went bust, leaving only her husband Sam at the helm. According to the administrator, Dildum developments had likely been insolvent since July 2017. I recommended in my report that it would be in the creditor's interest to place the company into liquidation. If you're able to uh, establish that a company has traded whilst it's insolvent, you can effectively pursue the directors for the quantum of that claim in their personal capacity. So that means you can recoup a portion of those funds or all of those funds, depending on the circumstance, from the director's personal assets. But there was no liquidation and directors were not pursued. Instead, creditors, many of them companies linked to Dildum, accepted a proposal under which Sam Fayed paid a small fraction of the 180 million owed. The quantum of money that was contributed was $8 million. $8 million against debts well in excess of $100 million. That's the circumstance, yes. When creditors accept such a deal, directors who've potentially broken the law can avoid the consequences. The liquidator disappears and then there is nothing to investigate. There's no insolvent trading claims. There's no other claims that are in a liquidator's uh, pocket to, to chase money back and get money back for creditors. They all go away. All the liquidators and administrators made reports to the corporate watchdog ASIC, flagging possible breaches of the law by directors of Dildum-linked companies, but it failed to act. I felt disappointed with that outcome. We provide ASIC with the various reports that they require, and they have to make a decision. In the Bauer case, a decision was made not to pursue further or to investigate further. It is startling. These directors in this group of companies haven't seemed to have had the full investigation that I think most insolvency practitioners would have liked to have seen take place.
After all this time, ASIC has finally done something. Sam Fayed's been charged with criminal breaches of company law, and yet, Dildum lives on. Sam Fayed's sons are running a rebranded business fashioned out of the shell of a Dildum subsidiary. Fayed Fayed and Ramon Fayed are now the directors and owners of Ellison Property. Their parents are behind a company that develops apartments for Ellison. And Ellison's marketing arm is the former Dildum Apartments renamed. Everyone knows um, what they do best. Not building apartments, apparently. Ellison's been hit with complaints and orders to fix serious defects. And amid the outcry, Fayed Fayed has applied to deregister Ellison Property Holdings, the company that owns the shares in Ellison Property, claiming it has no liabilities or assets of value. We tried to reach the Fayeds by email, by phone, and then at the office. It's all very secure. I thought I could see a shadow of someone moving around, but they don't seem very willing to come to the door. We tried at home. Finally, Fayad and Ramon Fayad's lawyer responded on their behalf to our questions. He said they'd merely sought to deregister Ellison Property Holdings because the trading name was no longer required, denying this was anything untoward. He added that Ellison was working to rectify defects identified in its buildings and apologised for delays. Uh, administrators make reports and the regulator, ASIC, have just got to get on and do their job. And perhaps if they'd acted 10 years ago, perhaps some of the issues that we're seeing currently might have been tidied or, or may not have come out to be uh, evolved. ASIC has to be far more effective in being seen to enforce the law because at the moment they're really the watchdog without teeth. Professor Jason Harris wrote the textbook on insolvency. He's analysed ASIC's track record for prosecuting directors over the past 24 years. His conclusion is scathing. It's manifestly inadequate. It is a blight on our corporate regulatory system. And the sad fact about this is that the bad guys know full well that this is how the system works. You're highly unlikely to be prosecuted. Jason, come on, grab a seat. Thank you. So here we have some statistics about the total number of reports from liquidators in the last financial year, of those cases where it requested further information, less than 20% was what ASIC actually took action on, and that involves 66 matters. I think what we should be seeing is far more criminal prosecutions against insolvent trading than what we see ASIC doing. It's well known. It is a standard business practice that building and construction companies incur debt and then don't pay those debts and then open up a new company, switch the assets, switch the staff that they want to keep and, and leave the uh, creditors behind. That's a, a business model in the building industry. ASIC told us it carefully assesses available information and intelligence to make sometimes difficult decisions about where, when and how to take action. It didn't explain why it took so long to act against anyone involved with Dildum. John Murray has a flight to catch. He's got a plan that could transform the building industry, one he believes would help ensure people get paid. Stopping the rot that sees subcontractors carry the losses when builders go broke. And he's got some high-profile backing. 
John Murray wants legislation to make builders set aside money in trust for work done by subcontractors. Hello, Senator. <laughs> the Senator again. Yeah, good. More than five years after he wrote a report for Parliament on the issue, he's still fighting for change. Since the last time we caught up, yeah. I've spoken to a number of subbies yeah. who uh, there were a couple of collapses here in Canberra. Pink out of pocket. It just requires um, national leadership, yeah. it really does. Yeah. The trust fund model that I propose will ensure that the subcontractors who carry out the work will be, will be appropriately protected and that the payments that the builder receives will be implied by law to be, uh, to be trust funds and therefore ring-fenced. So builders will not be able to use those funds as free working capital and in circumstances where a builder falls over and becomes insolvent, those funds are not able to be distributed to other, other creditors. What could happen to builders who breach that trust, who spend the subbies money? Then he's got some serious explanations to do because he's been in breach of trust. The consequences of breaching those trusts is that ultimately the builder will be accountable to the subcontractor and ultimately could potentially go to jail. So this is a summary that... Murray's plan would effectively push the small operators up the queue in liquidations, above the banks, no longer at the end of the line getting cents in the dollar or nothing. What kind of response have you got from the new government? Well, this is in Labor's platform. This is something that they've committed to doing. I don't understand why it isn't a priority, given the huge issue that it is. Over 1,600 building collapses already th this, this year. And you know, who carries the can? It's the tradies. But the federal government is equivocating, and industry lobby groups are fighting it. It will remove significant cash flow from a business and a lot of our contracts are very heavily weighted being paid from our customers at the back end. So, you know, for us to then to have money tied away with subcontractors yeah, while we need money to actually run the, the their organisations. So I don't think it, it will work. We're committed to making sure that our subcontractors have the liquidity to deliver their works and we don't think using trust accounts is the most efficient way to deliver that. It's not their money. It's the subcontractors' money. It's the subcontractors that have done the work. They should be paid for the work that they have done. And it is improper for builders to use other people's money. It's unethical, it's improper, it's immoral. You know, it's a great idea. Man, yeah, it's a good idea. It is a good idea, but they'll probably find you'll have a shortage of builders because they won't be able to afford to do it, unless the whole system changes. If there were laws to make sure that builders set aside money in trust for subbies like you to make sure they got paid, what difference would that make? Huge, huge difference. I think it will be, it'll be changing a lot of things. So I think there will be more builders come out to build a house and more trade like to join this industry. At the end of the day, staying in the industry will be a struggle for Sandy Chen. And home is no sanctuary from the anxiety and stress the collapse of Porter Davis has caused him. If we didn't get this million dollar back to our business, I don't know my business can keep going or not. I don't want to close down, but I don't know how far I can go in. Because like, uh, you can see my bank in my bank account. Now I only have 26,000 left in my bank account. I don't know how does this 26,000 can running how long. To pay his bills and keep his business alive, he may be forced to sell his home. If like uh, I lost my business, I lost my house, I don't want, I just don't want to think about the part. It's just horrible. 
is horrible. 